We also do over half of the extramurally funded uh, research that's supported by the National Institutes of Health, and uh, three quarters of all physicians will end up training in, in one of our member teaching hospitals. So what do we know? We know that the population is getting older, and if you look at utilization by different age ranges in the population, you young kids like me that are under 18, luckily I just take them to their general pediatrician every once in a while to keep all their preventive stuff up to date. If something really you know, acute happens, sometimes I can take them to an urgent care uh, or another provider. That tends to be the case where we use lower amounts of services and mostly primary care until you start hitting a certain age, and I'm, I'm hitting that point now, which is really interesting, um, where you start to see other specialists as well because you develop other problems that um, your primary care medical home can coordinate, can help facilitate making sure that you stay on track, but it often involves visits to uh, surgeons, medical specialists, uh, radiology uh, centers, et cetera. And you can see that by the time people hit 75 and older, which more Americans will be doing in the coming years, um, they're using not more of just primary care, but really all those other specialty services as well. So when we think about what do, how many physicians do we need per capita, you've got to think about who that per capita is, who's in the denominator, and increasingly, we're moving towards the right side of this graph. So there are a couple of things that, that we know. We have known knowns, as uh, somebody famous would say. Mm -hmm. We have increased insurance coverage. That appears to be mm -hmm. tracked uh, with another 8 million, perhaps as many as, as another 30 million people. Uh, by the end of the next uh, decade, we know that there will still be about 30 million people uninsured uh, at that time, uh, short of any other major policy changes. The population is growing overall. As I said, it's aging. Uh, they need uh, more services and more intense services. We're about to enter a point where if we don't train more physicians, we're going to start to see a decline in the number of physicians per capita. And that's just at a time when those patients are going to use more services. Uh, and we always talk about, well, can we, with our technological and medical advances, actually um, really get rid of the need for some care? Probably not. Over the course of a lifetime, we've done a better job of keeping people alive uh, with what was once fatal disease is now being chronic disease. So we grow up and we have diabetes and we have uh, heart disease and lung disease, cancers, traumas. We stay alive, we treat those people for longer, and if you look over the course of that lifespan, lifespan those people are going to use more services. We can provide better care, we can delay the need for some other uh, interventions, but over the course of a lifetime, it's more. And there are reasonable discussions where people disagree about you know, what's demand and, and use versus what do people really quote unquote need, very difficult thing to get at. Assumptions about how is the future system going to look different from today's system? Will we really find a way to be uh, more efficient, <clears throat> more effective, better at prevention? I hope so. Um, but all of those are sort of shifting unknowns. And when you add all of this together, what we find is that by the end of the next decade, we're going to be short somewhere around 130,000 physicians. Will it be exactly 130,000? No. I will be wrong. Our data will be wrong. Things will change. What we do know is that directionally, because of the expanding need for services, because we've gotten better at keeping people alive with chronic diseases that we now need to treat, we know that we're going to need more, not fewer, physicians. And very likely more of all those other health professionals that are increasingly part of an effective team, everyone from uh, the scribe and medical assistant through the PA or nurse practitioner. And when we break down the, the shortages, and I, I've seen projections on both sides. It's going to be all primary care. It's going to be all subspecialties. We think it's probably in between, that we are certainly going to need particularly adult primary care moving forward, and then many <coughs> other specialties. Uh, and, and Dr. Bates will talk uh, to this in a moment, but um, certainly medical specialties like oncologists and nephrologists uh, and cardiologists are all going to be important. So as I said, we have been expanding to try and address the shortage. And you can see that uh, we have um, newly accredited and schools that are applying for accreditation all over the country. Um, while we'd like to see as much of this education be as distributed um, broadly as possible, there are some uh, challenges to uh, founding these schools anywhere because of the, the sheer volume of clinical patients you need. Many of them have uh, branch campuses that are in more rural areas uh, of states. Uh, across the country. But you can see that growth has happened. And that's happened since uh, about 2003, 2004. We didn't come out and say uh, that we thought we needed to expand enrollment until about 2006. That's when we really saw a crisis coming long before the ACA was passed 
because this is really driven by the growth in the demographics of the population, ACA speeds it up a little bit. We get people in, uh, hopefully, to, to provide better care a little earlier than they would have been in the system, uh, but really this has been a long-term challenge. So we're starting these new med schools. We have many schools that have actually expanded enrollment, uh, increased in some cases by 15, 20, or more percent. So the challenge is, uh, how do you get there? Uh, and that's where our little exercise comes in. So most people go through the traditional route of applying to college, getting in, spending four years. Some people that didn't know they wanted to go to med school then do a post back program to additionally prepare for med school. Another four years in med school, you can wear a white coat, we'll call you a doctor, but you're not quite finished. So you have to have residency training anywhere from three to seven years. Um, Dr. Morse and I, uh, both are general internists, so luckily we stopped at three. If you're a neurosurgeon, six, seven. We're, we're slower learners. Yes, yeah. they are. <laughs> you're good for some stuff, though. Um, to get into that residency uh, program after medical school, graduates, by and large, go through something called the MATCH, the National Residency Matching Program. We just had that in the last uh, six weeks. And every day, we announce the match results. Well, everybody finds out in the same day, did I get into that medicine program that I wanted to get into? Did I get into the neurosurgery program? Did I not get in at all? Now, there are challenges here. Um, we, we are trying to figure out how you plan a workforce to care for that aging population. So even if everybody wants to become a dermatologist and work in Cleveland, it ain't going to happen. Um, and just because you want to become a licensed physician, there's no guarantee after graduating from medical school either here from an MD or a DO program or uh, internationally abroad, that you're going to get a residency spot. And in 2014, there were 1,800 current and prior medical school grads from the US that did not match. So let's find out what happened to you. Everybody open your envelopes, please. Good music for this? <laughs> Drum roll. Ah! <laughs> Some of you got pink slips. How about that? <laughs> so imagine this going on across the country when you and 20,000 of your closest friends find out where you're going to spend the next three to eight years of your life. And this sets you on the path for the future. I know we have a couple of residents in addition to. Uh, Dr. Morris in the room, so they can probably still remember their match day. I remember my match day, uh, and I just remember looking at that envelope and finding out where I was going, and I was very lucky to be able to go do primary care out in San Francisco. Um, but I had friends that were not so lucky. So let's take a little quiz. We're going to do the match day IQ game. So what percentage of U.S. seniors do you think match to neurosurgery? Take a guess. So anyone, anyone. 3%, 1.2%, you're close. What percentage of U.S. seniors match to anesthesia? 4.6%, you're seeing a pattern here. What percentage of U.S. seniors matched into family medicine? 8.5. So it's all, now, if you matched into internal medicine, family medicine, or pediatrics, raise your hand. Okay, now if you match it to dermatology, raise your hand. Oh, you got one. <laughs> match it to plastic and reconstructive surgery. One, hey. That's not the program you're in now, though, right? Is that the program you're in now, Michael? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, change of plans. How many people here didn't match? Okay, and these are reflective of a typical US graduating class. Um, the other thing is, how many people are U.S. citizens that went to a foreign medical school that didn't match? There's a couple of you as well. So again, just to give you a sense of you know, what the overall numbers look like, we are trying to do a good job in training physicians uh, and other health professionals for the future. And there are about uh, almost 27,000 physicians that were available, first-year physicians, <coughs> to graduates of, of medical schools <coughs> in the match. 47% of those were in internal medicine, pediatrics, or family medicine. Now, not all of those people will stay in primary care, but that pipeline is still 
pretty strong. However, here's the challenge. We had 34,000 people applying for 26,678 positions. And that includes US grads that didn't match, that were seniors, 975. And prior US grads, who now we worry are going to be left in the system accumulating and not being able to obtain a residency position to go back and actually serve their communities. Here's the other challenge. In 2006, the AAMC said, we need to do a couple of things. We need to expand medical school enrollment by about 30% through new and existing schools. And the federal government needs to lift its cap on Medicare support for GME, graduate medical education, or residency training, for paying their share of the cost. We started that expansion. We are successful. Um, US MD programs have expanded, uh, are on track to expand by about 30% in the next couple of years. DO programs have actually uh, doubled in size uh, in the last decade. So they're at over uh, 65, uh, almost 6,500 students a year that enrolled in 2013, 2014. So that means today we have first year medical students and DO students numbering 26,500. If we don't do something about expanding capacity on the residency side, uh, that would have been a lot of wasted investment for us as a society and for those individuals uh, in their own education. And again, just to give you a sense of how many people <laughs> How many spots is that total? So you could you could you could grow. Mm -hmm. And and look at the numbers here. I mean, genetics doesn't even make it on this graph because it's only the the, the largest the largest training programs. If you look at all again, adding up all those trainees in the three generalist primary care disciplines. Uh, we sort of likely to have about 7,000 of them a year continue on in the primary care. The numbers are much smaller. We're only training about 500 uh, oncologists a year, a couple of hundred neurosurgeons a year. So the other thing that's difficult to do is if you want to build in one specialty, it's very difficult to take away training programs from other specialties because we really aren't uh, training that many. So again, why do so many people go unmatched? Um, this really comes back down to the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Uh, that today we're okay with that match between U.S. students, at least for MDs, and uh, GME physicians, but they're quickly going to come into a bottleneck. Uh, and just a reminder, Medicare and uh, often state Medicaid programs make two distinct payments uh, for graduate medical education. One is a direct medical education payment which supports the cost of uh, training that resident and the faculty time and their stipends and the overhead associated with it. And the rest are indirect medical education payments, which I'm happy to talk about at length, which really go to support services that lose money, things like geriatrics, some of your trauma and standby um, facilities like level one trauma centers and burn centers. Um, but here's the real problem. This has been going on now for several years where the top green line are the number of applicants to residency positions, and the maroon line at the bottom is the number that we actually have compounded by this growth in medical school and osteopathic medical school enrollment. Uh, and I think the other challenge that's really uh, been pressing on us is that in an era of um, deficit reduction, one of the things that's been thrown on the table as a suggestion is, well, let's, let's cut current funding for graduate medical education. Uh, the accreditors last year, the follow-up survey of uh, folks that are designated institutional officials, they're responsible for all the training in their health systems, and if 10% reductions occurred in this support, 30% of directors said they'd cut or close training positions. Uh, if that were reduced even further, you'd see up to a one-third loss in existing training positions. So our policy has been for the last several years that we don't need to erase that entire 130,000 physician shortage, and we ought not to address that strictly by training more doctors, that we ought to be able to train another 4,000 doctors a year, maybe a 15% increase that'll get us a third or half of the way to addressing a shortage. And then we have to figure out how we use other health professionals on the team, figure out how we better integrate and create more efficient models of care, but it's not an either or. We need to really be doing all of these things to serve particularly the elderly moving forward, but many others. And again, that we can't simply move physicians around and say, well, we think you're training too many oncologists or neurosurgeons. The numbers aren't there. Uh, as much as people will bash 
dermatologists. You saw there's one person going into dermatology. There's about 300 uh, or so trainees a year, 400, uh, and that's nothing compared to the 13,000, 12,000 we're training in those primary care disciplines. And that if you really want to figure out how to get physicians and other health professionals interested in particular specialties, you've got to leverage the reimbursement system. And the same is true for figuring out how you get health professionals in underserved areas. You've got to get people from those areas interested in careers uh, in healthcare, and you've got to figure out how to pay them adequately uh, to live in those areas. And that we need to figure out how to do this all together. And the idea is, let's start here with a small increase in training uh, and resources devoted to that, but at the same time, let's continually monitor and figure out, do we need to ramp up later on? Do we need to scale back? Are we really fixing things with uh, other healthcare uh, professionals? Um, and again, there is legislation out there, so I would ask you uh, to have your bosses consider S-577 uh, in the Senate and both H.R. 1180 and H.R. 1201 uh, in the House. Uh, we'd appreciate that. So what I hope you've gotten out of, of my uh, introductory comments is that we have a shortage of docs. It's going to get worse. Uh, we have hundreds of medical school graduates, doctors, who are not able to complete their training at this point, uh, and you can help by sponsoring co-sponsoring that legislation. Um, contact information is here. We have lots of AAMC staff in the room if you want to have a follow-up conversation after discussion.